hard to say what philosophy is. Consider the example of Aristotle's metaphysics, perhaps his most famous set of works. But it wasn't called metaphysics by Aristotle. Rather, when librarians were compiling all his books, they put his books on physics together. And then after that, on the shelf, they put everything else. And they called it metaphysics, beyond physics. It was just a description of how they shelved it. And this way of thinking about philosophy in terms of what it is not, rather than what it is, can be useful. For example, we can think of philosophy as covering pre-theoretic fields of inquiry, places where we don't have paradigms. And if we do that, it, it can explain why there can be a lot of disagreement about what philosophy should pay attention to and what tools it should use, basically how it should work. Our guest this week is Simon Critchley, Hans Jonas Professor of Philosophy at the New School in New York, among many other prestigious academic appointments. Uh, he was also the series moderator for many years of The Stone, a very influential and popular forum for philosophy hosted by the New York Times. And he's the author of a bookshelf's worth of books, rather like Aristotle, covering a diverse set of themes. Simon is perhaps best associated with the Continental School of Philosophy, and, and that's a label that I use with some hesitation for reasons we'll get into. Uh, he's an expert on Heidegger, for instance. Um, but really, I, I think of him as a no-holds-barred sort of guy. For instance, if you uh, read his notes on, on suicide, firstly, just the topic is one which very few philosophers have, have, have written about, um, among them Hume, and he quotes and Hume and analyzes the arguments of, of Hume in some detail, but he also quotes the British band from the 90s Black Box Recorder. There's this healthier reverence. One, one gets the sense from Simon that he's always seeking for the best source of, of knowledge or wisdom, wh wherever that may be, the best source of expression, uh, in contrast to the kind of caricature that you sometimes have of continental philosophy of people endlessly commenting on, uh, I don't know, Hegel or Sartre or something, uh, and, and, and trying to be an iconoclast, but actually just building up new icons. In the email back and forth that I had with Simon leading up to this conversation, uh, I described uh, this podcast as, as me scratching some intellectual itches. And he replied, for me, life has been one long rash. And perhaps that's the best positive description of philosophy, one which tells us what it is and not what it isn't. It's the scratching of itches. You're listening to multiverses. Simon Critchley, thank you for, for joining me. Thank you very much for having me, James. I, you've written that philosophy begins not in wonder or 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 in a kind of sense of abundance uh, and overflowing of um i don't know concepts to analyze and so forth but but rather in disappointment yes and a sense that there's there's something missing a hole to fill and and i was curious does this match your own personal journey in, into philosophy disappointment yeah yeah sure yeah gosh i mean the um the wonder thing is, uh, I just think it's just very over, overstated. You know, it's the view that Aristotle attributes to thinkers, not really philosophers, physiologi, physiologists, as they were called, who preceded him. And so they had a feeling of wonder for nature. But Aristotle doesn't say that he has it, and he just proceeds with his kind of analytic taxonomical rigor and so but it you know it, it's a popular line of thought so people get disappointed when you take away wonder but you know i just begin from the idea that the world is howlingly defective in all sorts <laughs> of ways uh you know there's there's moral wrong political injustice and uh personal disappointment, the absence of any religious fulfillment, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. So if you begin from disappointment, you end up with a series of problems, which uh, philosophy can help to 
to give you a kind of pattern for thinking them, thinking them through, maybe not answer them, but think them through. So it doesn't end with disappointment. So people always think that I'm a philosopher of disappointment. No, philosophy begins in disappointment. It ends, I think, in something like courage or affirmation or commitment. But you don't necessarily get there from wonder. Uh, where do you, If you just have wonder, then where does that go? What, just, you just going to feel wonder? It'd be like watching an endless Terence Malick movie, you know? Just be this sort of sense of the glowing, shining of all things. I mean, it's a good, it's a good retail line for philosophy, but uh, I just think it's wrong. And it certainly not, doesn't make sense of whatever we might call the modern world. So, yeah, that's, and that does, I certainly, yeah, I was uh, disappointed. <laughs> a disappointed youth and um you know for all sorts of reasons and then and then the world was disappointing particularly you know being around what was happening in in britain in the late 70s early 80s uh, thatcherism falklands war uh, massive unemployment the collapse of the labor party in the face of that and so that was that was pretty disappointing, and and the almost certain threat of nuclear annihilation. <laughs> so that was that was disappointing, and then um, and also the sense of you know whether there's anything bigger out there, transcendent out there, godlike out there that might fill in some of the meaning gaps. So I begin beginning from the idea of disappointment leads you into the question of really how you confront the issue of, of nihilism, you know, and, and the idea that all the highest values have devalued themselves, Nietzsche's point. And that, you know, and that's something which is a way of doing philosophy, which is much more, much more common in the, let's say, the, the continental philosophical tradition than it is. I think, I think it's there in the Anglo-American tradition in, countless different ways but it's much more explicit in that tradition because it's linked to you know uh, the sociology of you know uh, Weber and the, you know the economic social economic theory of Marx and so on and so forth so the idea that philosophy has to be allied to social sciences say and they have a and there are, there are problems that need to be addressed and you can't just sit back and wonder you know that's not really good too much so yeah it's it's an it's an active uh, it invites you to be more active perhaps disappointment than than wonder at least yeah. or maybe do something more practical I, i'm also curious that you were a punk as well as a philosopher i don't know if those things overlapped or if it was was there a kind of do you think they were both responses to the same sense of disappointment oh. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I grew up with you know around, you know, my 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 teachers were hippies. Um, my you know, the, well, there were the older teachers who were sadists, and then there were the the new young kind of hip teachers who were all hippies. And the the context was very much informed by that late sixties, early seventies mood of I don't know, peace, love, understanding. You know, and to some extent, elements of a what seemed like an emancipatory counterculture that I mean that just that fell to pieces um, it was also very class based it was a very middle class view of the world it turns out produced some great things but and so for people like me the early 70s were kind of disorientating and uh things were really there was a sense of really things really falling apart and whatever whatever that you know love peace and revolution message of the late 60s meant had gone completely sour by the the mid 70s and people like me were listening to this is this is the funny thing about punk that there was no movement there was no no name there were people that just found found similar bits of music, similar similar LPs at around the same time, and then began to connect that together. Uh, the bands like the MC5, 
Iggy and the Stooges and the Velvet Underground, and people just found these things. And then you discovered that there were, oh, there's a few thousand people that are interested in this and were, you know, completely turned off by the kind of excesses of progressive rock in the mid 70s and by the kind of empty hedonism of hippies. And, uh, and we wanted to, you know, tear things down and, you know, smash things up. And, and it was, it was a very kind of nihilistic, but incredibly energizing time to be in, you know, particularly to be not that far from, because it was also, it, punk was also a, largely a kind of phenomenon of the suburbs. You know, it's people in Bromley or where I was in North Hertfordshire looking at London, which had kind of fallen to pieces. You know, the streets were full of trash and and thinking, well, this is, yeah, something's happening there. That looks great. Let's get there and, you know, see what's going on. And then um, fashion was very important. And mainly, mainly it was about music. Everyone was in a band. I was in bands for years and then... Um, and then basically what happened was that I had a a, a, a a serious industrial accident when I was 18. I um, was working in a pharmaceutical factory and my left hand, which is my writing hand and my guitar playing hand, was nearly severed in an, in an accident. And it took, um, it took, you know, I was, I was 18, so I was fit and young, which was great. But it took an awful long time to uh, recover from that, and that, and and the psychological effect of that was to sort of wipe out. Uh, it had an effect on memory, which trauma often has, you know, actual physical trauma, and so I kind of just forgot all sorts of things about. I still, you know, I was reminded of them later by, say, my mother and my sister, but th I just forgot things. And so it felt like at 18, I had a new, you know, a sort of tabula rasa, uh, a kind of empty page I could begin to fill out. And that's where I, I was doing you know, really shitty jobs. And uh, I'd failed everything at school. And I was, you know, expecting to be in a band that was going to make it because some of my friends were in bands that made it and, you know, but that didn't happen. And then I began to read and then went back to a, what was a further education college in Stevenage, the, the, the hell hole of Stevenage, Newtown. Yeah. And, but By the way, I know all these places. My sister lives in Letchworth. <laughs> oh, really? well, I grew up in yeah. Letchworth. I know. Yeah. It's the uh, it, it, you know it look when I go back now, which is which is rarely. I mean, it, you know, you think, wow, this was it's an amazing. It was an amazing social experiment in kind of utopian, yeah, planning. But I mean, for people who don't know, we should say yeah that. Oh yeah, that the idea was we, the government wanted to build these beautiful new garden cities where people would have the space to play and also you know businesses to work in but it, it didn't really work out because everyone just commuted into london <laughs> and uh it didn't really sustain the yeah the communities i think that they they'd hoped for maybe no it was it was it was a absolutely fascinating experiment and you know and it was done with um yeah with good old-fashioned good old-fashioned capitalism being used to further uh you know noble social purposes so it was quaker money uh, it wasn't government right. money it was quakers okay right because the quakers ran the confectionery business maybe they still do but they certainly did back then the round trees and the cabries and it was money connected to the quaker confectionery business and they had this idea of better housing conditions for ordinary people and the, the and the whole idea of extra was going to be a series of circles around Central Park. So I kind of, you know, if you, you read Plato's description of Atlantis, it's not in a million miles away, but it was, it was a you know, utopian social plan. Um, and it was, it was also completely ecologically uh, designed so that the, 
the industrial area. There was an industrial area. My dad worked there was um, away from the town, so the all the smoke from the factories went the other way. <laughs> so we had this lovely clean air. It was perfect, but you know, you I think it's I think it's your duty to kind of hate the place that you're from. <laughs> um, yeah. But then I got to with Stevenage, and I did A levels, remedial O levels, and A levels, and um, and then um, and then went to university late at twenty two, and uh, and then the story takes another turn. Is this am I recording? Fine. Is it coming out? Good. Yeah. Morning? Yeah. Yeah. I see it coming. I I see waveforms. Or waveforms will do. So then I got a second chance, and that's I guess that's what you know. Yeah, I got a second chance. I went to Stevenage Further Education College. I was on the dole for a year, and then I was able to get some way of mixture of working and and this was a yeah, these colleges were for people where people did hairdressing and catering and places like that. But there was a there was a an English department, just a couple of people, and they were and I started to read poetry and learn Middle English and did all sorts of things. And then the world began to open up. And then when I got to university at 22, I wanted to do literature because that was what I really thought I was passionate about. I am, but that was the, that was the thing. And uh, particularly Joyce and Pound and Eliot and the classic modernists. And then um, I, uh, my fourth option was a philosophy class. And uh, this, this, this New York guy, this Jewish New Yorker called Jay Bernstein, showed up in the room and began to talk. And and I thought, wow, you know, I've never seen this before. Uh, he was, I remember him saying in the first class that philosophy is not for stupid people. So if there are any stupid people in the class, they should <laughs> leave now. And I thought, oh, this is good. This is where I want to be. And I couldn't figure out how my philosophy teachers thought. I couldn't, my English teachers, literature teachers, I, I, you know, they knew a lot more about what they were talking about than I did, obviously. But I could sort of figure out what they were up to uh, in my young, naive arrogance. But the, the philosophy teachers genuinely perplexed me. And it also it didn't involve as much reading. It was you're reading smaller texts, more closely and intensely and that appealed to me i couldn't keep up with um you know 600 page novels every week so then i decided to do philosophy and then you know then things changed and i i you know and i really still incredibly grateful that i went to this provincial university at University of Essex, and uh, it really changed everything for me. And uh, I ended up working there, and it's a long story. I mean, it's a horrible campus, but it's it was a really interesting experiment, like Sussex and Warwick and York, the so-called new universities of the 60s. It, yeah, it, it's interesting to me that they were teaching in the continental tradition of philosophy rather than... England doesn't see itself as being on the continent for some reason. I mean, it's not on the mainland continent. <laughs> it's doing its best to yeah. separate itself as much as possible for some uh, unfathomable reason. But yeah, the tradition, I guess, for the last century or so, had had somewhat diverged from what was happening in Paris and and, and um, Frankfurt and and other European schools, perhaps. But, but it oh, seems that yeah, the maybe the kind of new universities in, in England were aligning themselves with yeah a different camp, I guess. I mean, analytic philosophy, as it was so called, you know, uh, this is really you know, there's this begins in the early 20th century with Russell, but it really takes on that name and and also the idea, you know, the idea, the idea of say British empiricism. What is British about empiricism? Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Since the 18th century with the French. And, um, you know, so we have these abstract ideas of philosophy then linked to territory, you know, to place, which is, which is perfectly ridiculous. And analytic philosophy, which was full of 
I mean, really very interesting people. I did my MPhil thesis on on logical positivism, uh, and it, with a, in particular focus with uh, on the work of Rudolf Carnap, at the the Vienna Circle, and um, and then. So I was, you know, and my, my teachers at Essex were, if there was a common thread, it was Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein was right. the, common, the common language. And that's, that's also, it's, it's, it's striking in the United States that that's not the case. It's never been the case. Wittgenstein has never been a central figure. But in Britain, in those decades, Wittgenstein was a kind of common language. And if you could yeah. link it to Wittgensteinian lines of thought, then, you know, there were, there were ways of talking across these 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 divides, which were largely, you know, ones that had been invented, and um, and, and and analytic philosophy became very narrow in the nineteen sixties. Uh, philosophy of language became a very narrow linguistic philosophy, and all sorts of big questions were just considered to be uh, pseudo problems or irrelevant or didn't have to be answered. And philosophy prided itself on its narrowness, its scientificity, its rigor, and its um, its hostility to any connections to other disciplines, apart from the natural sciences and the, perhaps cognitive science too. And so I mean, that that's that has changed, but it still hasn't changed enough. It has changed, and the continental tradition is so called. And of course, this is all. This is all, you know, the way it's talked about is all nonsensical. The distinction between analytic and continental, I wrote a little little book on this years and years ago, and it goes back to John Stuart Mill. I mean, Schill, John Stuart Mill talks about two tendencies in the English philosophical mind, uh, one of which is empiricist, Benthamite. So Bentham, his, his, uh, his teacher, his mentor that he then, you know, recovers from after his nervous breakdown, John Stuart Mill, and uh, a Coleridgean tendency, romantic, interpretive, hermeneutic, uh, speculative. And these two aspects are both, you know, they're, they're, they're competing constituents of the English philosophical mind. So, and he calls that continental philosophy, that Coleridgean tendency. So that goes back to the 19th century. And that continental tradition which was alive and well in places like oxford with the you know the domination of hegel and people like there's a whole british hegelian movement and you know that then gets kind of pushed out and i I, my my thesis has always been uh, has been for a while that the continental philosophy philosophy in this broad sense gets pushed out of mainstream philosophy progressively in the 20th century, maybe in the name of scientific rigor, but that re-emerges as things like English literature, which begins in you know, around 1925 when it's imported from the colonies, from India, where it had been used to train Indian colonial administrators into Cambridge. And, and that lot, English then soaks up a lot of that continental Stuff and that's why continental philosophy, so called, ends up being taught in literature departments, language departments, and that's still to some extent the case. But you know, it's as as a professional matter, the distinction distinction between analytic and continental is kind of, I think, it's pretty boring and narrow. But the idea that there are different tendencies of habits of mind, one of which is kind of you know, narrowly empirical, skeptical, and science-driven, and another which is more open, romantic, circumspective. I think is, you know, I think that's that 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 makes sense as a kind of a cultural feature. I mean, how do you explain, you know, somewhere like England, which has, you know, the traditions of natural science and you know, and uh, but also people like William Blake and uh, and Shelley and uh, and so on and so forth. So I think you know it's um, it's a way of making sense of uh, culture. And, and for me, you know, for, for for people like me, you know, the key thing is that philosophy is philosophy has a 
a duty, uh, an obligation to be part of the life of a culture, right? The way in which a culture reflects on itself, thinks about itself. And that was not the world that I was educated in. That was not happening in, in, um, in philosophy, professional philosophy in the, um, and that, and that has changed. I think that has improved and that, that makes me very happy. Yeah. I, I have a quote that I was reminded of, uh, today, uh, and I thought it's so apt for you. Uh, it's from Miroslav Holub, the Czech poet. Uh, I've, uh, I've quoted it already in, in a previous episode of this podcast, but I'm so tickled by it. And I think it really works <laughs> for, for what you're just saying about the incorporation of philosophy into life. And uh, Hola wrote that he he preferred to write for people untouched by poetry. I'd like them to read poems in such a matter in such a matter of fact manner as when they're reading the newspaper or go to football matches. And um, you know, you've written yourself about football, and you yeah, you've moderated a um, sort of forum in the in the New York Times. So, <laughs> I mean, it's yeah. uncanny how that sort of matches yeah what you're saying that philosophy should should be something that that talks to the lives of people and not just to the predilections of philosophers yeah what was it football matches and what so yeah i would like them to read poems in such a matter of a fact manner as when they are re- reading the newspaper or go to football matches yeah exactly uh, yeah i'd link that to i'd link that to you know um there's this remark that then Bertolt Brecht makes in the when he, in the twenties when he's trying to you know tear down bourgeois naturalistic theatre and establish you know his own approach in in Berlin he calls it epic theatre epic theatre and what he what he and he talks about is the audience that he would like and he says the kind of audience I'd like at my theatre would be like the audience at a sports right. A football yeah. coach who'd be relaxed, most importantly, relaxed and attentive, knowledgeable, and smoking cigars and eating eating snacks. He says. So, and I think the a lot of the problem with philosophy is that it doesn't make people <laughs> relaxed. It it seems like an in, intimidating world, perhaps deliberately intimidating used as kind of cultural and intellectual capital to in, to kind of cow people. And uh, that's that's ridiculous. I mean, the the whole adventure begins with, you know, this person, Socrates, wandering around asking 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 matter of fact questions to other citizens and and not agreeing with their answers. And that's it. It's it's um it's in the public realm. It's in the it's in the agora. Philosophy only is a, you know, really becomes an academic discipline really in the late eighteenth century. You could say that with someone like Kant, but Kant didn't really teach philosophy. He was teaching geography, meteorology, mathematics, all sorts of things. So the idea of the academic philosopher kind of in the university is a, a very modern idea. Before that, we were either um, doctors, often like Locke. Or, uh, or courtiers uh, like Leibniz, you know, uh, attached to some kind of court structure. And and um, there's something to that. There's something to that. So, so the identification of philosophy with the university is a real problem. The, the audience for philosophy, I mean, I've always been convinced that there is an audience for philosophy and philosophy needs to change and adapt in order to meet that audience. And that's something which I think has just, you know, dramatically changed in the last 20, 30 years. And there is a lot more philosophy out there. I mean, it's, and then, you know, yeah, and you can, you, know, you can read, <laughs> you know, we, we had a column in the New York Times called The Stone, uh, which ran for, 11 years and it was great fun and the idea there was to use the most important media you know outlet in the united states i mean the the kind of the the, the importance that the new york times has in the minds of 
your average American educated liberal is hard to it's hard to fathom if you you know uh, it, it's enormous and it's actually got more enormous in in the last 15 20 years so we you know we very cannily kind of because the newspaper was the newspaper that was the you know the you know that was the gospel that was the the morning prayer of the atheists reading the new york times but they had this website you know, I'm using quotation marks around the website. And I got to work with an editor called Peter Catapano, who's remained a very good friend. And and we um we just began to do things on the website and nobody really gave a damn because it wasn't the newspaper, so it didn't matter. The newspaper mattered, the website was just something you needed to have. And then we you know, we we kind of realised that we we struck gold with this, and we'd um, we had big audiences and uh, and audiences that kept coming back for more of it, and so we um, we developed it, and it was it was great. And then as the as the medium changed, as uh, so now we're in exactly the reverse situation. The print newspaper is a kind of a nice, you know. Mm. People have it for sort of nostalgic reasons at the weekend. They like to have a newspaper around. They don't read it. They just like to look at it. Oh, that's a. But they're not looking at the the op eds, thinking, well, this is what is being thought at the moment. The, the old thing was you read the front page of the Times, and then you read the inside back page with the the op eds, and that would be the start of your day. Now it's gone completely digital, like everything else. So we. When that happened around 2014, 15, 16, we had an audience. We were sort of geared up for that, and it went really well. Until um, you know there were you know, political kerfuffles in 2020, post the murder of George Floyd, which led by a kind of in a circumlocutory way to a new situation where. They could no longer house series. They couldn't really have a series because they couldn't control it. And so we um, things drew to an end of, at the end of 21 or so. Yeah, and football, I, I, was, yeah, I yeah, was able to write about football in, in, uh, in the Times and, and the New York Review of Books. I, I wrote some things for New York Review of Books on, on football. That's actually where that, that began. Then you realize that God, I can talk about this thing that you know dominates my life. And then I did a class on football as well last year around the World Cup, which uh, which was going really well until we had a strike here at the in November. But that's the only time I've tried to teach that material and get people to think through, you know, the phenomenon of football and take it really seriously and that's a very good example because they've got <clears throat> you've got something you've got a phenomenon football that people understand with remarkable levels of complexity and uh, and there's a history and a sociology and all sorts of conceptual mm. things you can pull out of footballs so football's a fantastic phenomenon and once you get to talking about football then people relax right they because they know you know they know they know what's going on. So they, um, you get them to relax. They have opinions, you have opinions, and you can begin a conversation. So what I like we're talking about football, particularly with, with kids, actually, is that, you know, they, they're they just, just sponges for, for facts. And you're having a, a conversation of complete equality with a 10-year-old who knows a lot more than you do about, you know, which player is playing where for... And you know what their prospects are, what the what the what the XR ratings are, and so on and so forth. And it's so it's it's finding a phenomena that invite people in without without cheapening it, without making philosophy you know dumb. And there's there's lots of there's lots of that going on as well. So we don't want that. I want philosophy to be. You know, <clears throat> to maintain its 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 rigor, its level, its interest in its own history, and its deep questions, but to be in a way that is 
accessible to a larger audience and uh, and they feel relaxed about entertaining those questions and thinking them through yeah i think you've you've written yourself and certainly others have that philosophy is is almost the pre-theoretic theory or it's and it strikes me that that allows philosophy to enter almost any discussion because wherever you have an established field there is still a point where it touches the world and there's something inscrutable going on uh, and that's where that's where philosophy can can inform the discussion um, mm-hmm. coming back to this the, the and and I always hesitate to to call it this but the continental analytic divide mm-hmm. for the I come across another line recently in Pessoa, who I know you you love. Yeah, yeah, I do. And uh, I'm actually talking in about a month to Patricio Ferrari, who's one of the translators. He's based in New York, actually. Okay. He's along with Margaret Jewel Costa. He's he's been translating poet or sort of heteronym by heteronym the the works of Pessoa, and. Mm-hmm. Um, so one of his heterons, Alvaro de Campos, wrote this incredible piece I, I only read recently, Ultimatum. I don't know if you've come across it. I don't remember it, but let's go ahead. So it's one of his it's one of the prose pieces. And well, I'll tell you one of the it one of the early lines in it, uh, nothing to do with our discussion, but it's just so good. I, I've got to say it is he's, <laughs> early on. He says, get out Kipling, you merchandisable, practical man of verse, scrap iron imperialist, <laughs> which is just, yeah. Merchandisable is so prescient as well, given, you know, how Kipling has sold <laughs> really well and been Disneyfied and so forth. But then he goes on to talk about, um, and I think this must've been written about 1930 or so. He talks about how, how he thinks philosophy should be developed, and he says uh, he says that it, one of his conclusions is that philosophy should be integrated, uh, integration of philosophy into art and science, and the disappearance of philosophy as a metaphysical science. And so he he points to philosophy somehow disappearing, and on one side perhaps being subsumed within sciences and with the other being subsumed within the arts. And mm-hmm. it, it matches somewhat what you were, you were saying, how on the one hand we have people in the kind of tradition of Carnap who are, who are, who are saying, well, that's, philosophy is just, it's just a tool to help science, more or less. Scientific the world, yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, and on the other hand, you have philosophy almost as, as poetry or sometimes even written in the form of in a very poetic form, uh, as with Nietzsche, and, and certainly being very influential within the arts, as you know, Sartre and, and and many French philosophers and others were, and that leads me to you know to wonder: Are there? You've also put it in these terms. There's on the analytic side, people are perhaps more interested in the problem of knowledge and getting to truth, which seems to be very aligned with the sciences. Uh, and on the continental side, there's an interest in in getting to to wisdom, right? And both those both those are legitimate concerns. But it but it seems to me perhaps the analytic side of things is has got less road to run, if you like. If if we look at the tradition of, of the history of philosophy, we see many branches being subsumed successfully within sciences as natural philosophy um, mm-hmm. became physics. Um, and I would argue, you know, formal logic really belongs uh, to, to a branch of mathematics or to be understood as a, as a field like mathematics, at least, and, and, and shouldn't really be considered philosophy anymore. There are interesting things about formal logic, but actually running those calculations is not philosophy. right? And... Mm-hmm. We might say the same about cognitive neuroscience as well. And as soon as there's enough kind of crystallization of agreement in a field, it goes from being pre-theoretic to being theoretic. Um, and one wonders if many of the things that analytic philosophy has has been concerned with will just end up being uh, there being enough consensus that it that it reaches that they become part of. 
a, a science or, or or a kind of academic separate academic discipline yeah, whereas it's been the yeah. of holistic philosophers yeah so maybe they're gonna get there. maybe yeah. they'll be out of the job <laughs> i don't know on the other hand and i want to bring up impossible objects here because they seem to be things which will never will never be will never fit within a theory and perhaps you could tell us about impossible objects and oh. uh, yeah well the, the on the the other the larger point i mean philosophy is in a sense, I mean, one one way of thinking about philosophy is in terms of its disappearance. You could say, well, you know, uh, it's it's a line of thought that I mean, one of my heroes growing up was a guy called Jacob Bronowski, who wrote this uh, this, this, this documentary series on the BBC called "The Ascent of Man." That have changed that title now, but it was a wonderful. It was like the com- Competing, it was like the answer to Kenneth Clark's civilization uh, in terms of a history of science. And Bronowski, who was a you know, th- theoretical physicist of the first order, uh, but also a poet and a, a novelist and a person of immense culture, just says, well, there are two lines of human imagination. Uh, one line um, moves through science and scientific inquiry. Another line moves into literature and poetry and the arts and these are two these are two lines which are, which are both aspects of, of the imagination paths that they can travel down and they need to, they need to be unblocked and cultivated what's the role for philosophy there philosophy is kind of is you know is the remark that Bronowski is making about it it's the the second order reflection the step back so philosophy has always been in a sense about its disappearance into other disciplines and there's there's a long and sort of serious argument about whether philosophy should be studied as whether there should be philosophy departments and whether philosophy should be studied as a single honors subject i mean it used to be the case at many places that you couldn't do philosophy on its own you had to do it with politics and economics or whatever it might be and there's a case for that that philosophy should be there as a as a way of as a space for for thinking about foundational conceptual issues that affect every activity every every area of human learning so i'm quite keen on that i mean there's also the idea that you know philosophy as a as, as a pre-theoretical hmm how do i put this this is a more, more tricky point, but I mean, I'm, if I'm anything, I'm an existential phenomenologist. That's how I like to say to people because it, it, you know, nobody calls themselves that and it's anymore and it sounds silly. It's a lot of syllables, but <laughs> it sounds badass. <laughs> yeah. I think, that, you know, I'm, I think that we have to attend to that which shows itself phenomena and describe phenomena as as carefully as we can. And those phenomena are the phenomena that we encounter in our existence, our human existence, our life in the world with others and everything else that that entails. And so that, uh, I mean, Heidegger in one place, in I think in 1924, calls that a pre-science, like of a pre-science. It means that the sciences can, you know, do their thing very well but philosophy is there as a pre-science to accompany the procession of the sciences in a rather poorly chosen metaphor he even describes philosophers as the police force at the procession of the sciences i'm not sure what would be the police force but the but the the idea is interesting that we we are trying to at least people like me are trying to attend to the pre-theoretical dimension of human experience our actual lived engagement with the world with others with things and with and then everything that follows from that history and so on and so forth and but the minute that you make that explicit you turn that into a series of propositions you've made it reflective you've made it theoretical and that's that's the standard philosophical move you begin in the the world and then philosophy moves away from the world into a series of abstract theoretical problems, 
think about that in relation to say Descartes meditations. You just begin the process of doubt and then you try to find something which can arrest that movement of doubt. And that's given a, a theoretical answer. The, I, the, I think therefore I am. What phenomenology tries to then do is to say, well, we are, in a sense, we're doomed to reflection. I mean, it's, we're doomed to not just living in the world, but thinking about living in the world. So we live, we live in the world. You know, I, I, I'm always in, it's in those moments when you first wake up in the morning, you first become aware and you are, you're in a world, a, a room, an environment. And for those, that brief period of time, you are, you're just being there with, with things. Uh, and then your reflective agency moves in, you begin to sort your things out, do whatever you do in the morning. So the standpoint of reflection is something we're kind of inevitably doomed to. But the idea that philosophy should, should just remain at that standpoint, I think is wrong. The task is how we take that reflection and we turn it back towards the lived, shared, lived world. And that's what it's what Merleau Ponty calls in a lovely concept, hyper reflection. And hyper reflection is reflection upon the limits of reflection and where we try to return to what he calls the perceptual faith, that we begin, we begin our experience of the world with a perceptual faith. Right? The world is real, this stuff is meaningful, and things are in motion. And then how do we, how do we get back to that once we've become thinking things? I think is for me, you know, really, really important uh, philosophical question. And that requires a different approach, which does bring me kind of to impossible objects and to people like Pessoa, because I mean, Pessoa is fascinating because of, uh, all sorts of reasons, but the idea of writing in heteronyms in other voices, I, I've always found very interesting. I've, I've experimented with that myself in different forms. You know, that taking on another persona and writing in that name, and that can that name can even be your own name, but then you're fictionalizing it, and it gives that kind of distance. It's liberating. Mm. Borges uh, talks about the the other Borges, yeah, the one the one that writes. Right, and win yeah. prizes and yeah, uh, and the, the the I mean Kampos is is great, and then there's uh, the one that really the but the heteronym that I was most interested in was Alberto Cairo, who the the master, the master, yeah, shepherd, keep sheep, sheep on the yeah. in a cottage on the hill, and who you know who says you know who says the most banal things in poetry, you know what is is. I am a shepherd and I live in a cottage on a hill. And uh, why would I doubt any of this? Because this is what I see. And you talk all about s stones, rocks, and you know rivers and things. And don't reflect on them. There's, they just are. That would be an impossible object. That, that, so that idea of so the, the, the poetry that Cairo is trying to write, which is a kind of anti-poetry. You know, it's, it's poetry without, without flourish, without emendation. Is uh, the 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 wish is to just say things as things, right? Uh, there's a moment in you know in Rilke's Do We Know Elegies, where he's talking about you know the what would you say to an angel if an angel appeared? Um, ben Mendes uses this in Wings of Desire. What would you say to an angel if an angel appeared? Well, you'd say you wouldn't say you know you know have you thought about the heavens or whatever? You know, you'd say you'd say you know jug uh look bridge uh coffee cigarette <laughs> coffee and cigarette you know things like that and this would cause wonder in an angel so the saying of ordinary things is kind of the and the fact that we that we're doomed to get that wrong is kind of what's driving the impossible objects idea and i was also back then thinking about music specifically you know that music is something i've tried to write the, the the a book that will come out next year on mysticism which is some weird shit that ends up with a lot of discussions of music and i've i've just always had just that basic intuition that you know music makes sense of things in a way that other things don't 
And uh, but how do you say that? Because if you say that propositionally, you know you miss the you miss the phenomenon. So how do you get closer to the phenomenon? And if and you know what if our what if our pre theoretical life were more like music than like propositions? I think that's I think that's right. I mean you know if I think about Heidegger, I've been thinking about Heidegger again because I'm teaching him soon again. I mean, Heidegger begins from uh, two really simple thoughts. It's really all that he's concerned with. The first one is motion, the fact that everything is moving all the time, everything is moving. And the second is meaning, the fact that we find ourselves in a world that makes sense. Uh, So we find ourselves in a world that makes sense, and it's a world that's in motion. How do we uh, how do we say that? Because <laughs> if we say that philosophically, we freeze it into um, a kind of a, a map or a conceptual grid, and we miss the phenomenon. And 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 then the other thing to add is that we are you know we are meaning we're condemned to meaning, not freedom, but meaning. Um, we find ourselves in a meaningful context that is constantly moving. And the other things to add to that would be that human existence is, I'm borrowing here from a really good philosopher that I read for decades called Thomas Sheehan. Um, And Sheehan says the other two things is that human existence is asymptotic. It's always arriving at uh, a point, but it doesn't reach that point. Why? Because we're mortal, right? That end point is mortality, which is nothing. And we're always uh, we are we are possibility. We are in motion. We have meaning. We we are possibility moving towards some point that we're never going to reach. And we're mortal. This is going to end. We're going to die. And that's kind of, that's kind of how I see things, more or less. Yeah, I could say more, but that's 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 a whole bundle of stuff. But Pessoa is, yeah, would be a. You know, I, I, I tried to write something about him years ago, um, badly, I think. But that there's quite appropriately there's fragments about Basoa in your in your book, um, the ABC of Impossibility. Oh, yeah, a few, uh, at least one, I think a couple, maybe maybe a few mentions of him. Yes, yeah, yeah. it was. Uh, I was I was in Brazil. The only time I've been to Brazil, I was. Um, I was trying to, um, I was actually co-translating some pieces of Pessoa with a a Brazilian friend and uh, and trying to make sense of them because the the translations back then just weren't very good, you know. So, yeah, I had a go at that. And then I remember giving a talk on Pessoa um, at a poetry conference, I suppose, in Connecticut and being told by this formidably wonderful scholar called Marjorie Perloff. Oh, yes. Who's written a book on Wittgenstein's, Wittgenstein's notebooks, which is saucy, fantastic piece of which she's, 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 a, she's a wonderful person. And she said, yeah, what are you doing? What you're saying is fine, but you're not really interested in poetry. You're interested in kind of just saying things. That's, that's fine, but don't confuse that with poetry, which is stylization, emendation, you know, versification so on and so forth i mean she, she has a point yeah. um, but i'm so the poets that have interested me most like pessoa and stevens wallace stevens have been ones that are trying to say very plain things right very you know return to a plain sense of things and that's all the ordinary in its ordinariness has been a sort of constant concern of mine and how philosophy can approach that you know yeah, yeah. It, it seems like there's maybe different classes of impossible objects, and maybe the best way to touch the primitives, as it were, the stones and the trees and the rocks, is is via poetry, and mm-hmm. that's the best way to be attentive to them. But then there's things much more fluid and complex things, like like music, mm-hmm. or perhaps I shouldn't say more complex. They they're just impossible in a different sort of way. Yeah. But I think they they're going to keep they're going to keep philosophers busy. Right? 
I don't think we're ever going to. Maybe we're going to approach um, asymptotically, as it were, to to some sort of understanding of them. But but I'm not even sure if that's no. I don't think so. I think we're just going to turn them over and over, and I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, no, I, think so. I think you know the way I like to say this is that you know we've been. I mean, arguably, philosophy has been. You know, something like philosophy has been, has been around for as long as there have been human beings around in, you know, in this, you know, strange social adventure of, you know, of human beings. And so I'm completely open to comparative approaches and the fact that there could be a, you know, an Amerindian indigenous cosmology that is <clears throat> that's philosophically rich, fine. But philosophy in its... Um, you know, usually recognizable sense begins in Athens and, you know, fifth century, end of the fifth century BC with the person of Socrates. And he raises a series of questions, which are the questions that philosophers still raise and none of them have been answered. And that's, and that, that's the point is that it's about asking the questions and not hoping for, for answers. The answers are fraudulent the people that have the answers are our gurus are the <clears throat> yeah gurus the um the people that are promising extraordinary things usually in the next 10 to 15 years i'm reading you know right now i'm thinking about uh rising with a friend of mine uh something about ai uh because um i'd like to rise it with this friend of mine and we're looking at you know, the expectations that were made for AI in the, I mean, since the fifties onwards, but, you know, you know, <laughs> you know, 10 million self-driving cars will be on the road by 2020, 2016 business insider says Tesla motors, CEO Elon Musk promised that in 2019, a year from now, we'll have over a million cars with full self-driving software, everything and so on and so forth. You know, the, the, um, the fantasies around AI, the idea that there would be a, you know, a, a technological solution that will kind of abolish humans. Right? This, this is a theological, apocalyptic fantasy which has beset us for you know for millennia. So I think it's um, the task of philosophy is to that extent largely deflationary. It's largely negative it's when someone comes along promising things then you ask questions and uh, then you realize that what they're saying perhaps doesn't make sense and then do you offer a, an answer well socrates is quite funny about that he often doesn't give an answer the dialogue will just end or he'll tell a story there'll be an allegory the allegory of the cave most famously and so it's the idea that philosophy is does not make progress right it, it's 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 largely the same activity uh, of these large scale conceptual questions which just beset human beings and they should beset human beings and and it really helps if you are versed in this so i think the only i mean i think that i think education such as i mean i see it and i'm involved with it is a you know a, it's a an increasingly like fraudulent enterprise. I think the business of our education, the business of our education, is you know is is, is troubled for all sorts of reasons that make me really upset. So let's maybe not talk about it too much. But but philosophy is something that does need to be taught. You know, it's, it's something that repays if you like an apprenticeship with you know some people that you just think are really very interesting and you can read it on your own you can do it on your own but it really helps if you've got someone that can show you through i, I don't think that's as true of history or of uh literature i think you know you can you can find your way in other disciplines uh but with philosophy you know having that figure who will a teacher who will permit things that will allow things to happen is just it's incredibly liberating and that's so that's kind of what we're trying to do and um, more or less successfully yeah I, I don't know if I entirely agree that it needs to be taught but I, I certainly agree that it needs to be 
learned in contrast to you know if we think of the sophists who are sort of like the self-help snake oil merchants of their day you know charging for almost quick fixes and quick answers whereas uh socrates didn't take your money but he didn't really give you an answer either he just <laughs> unpicked your 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 beliefs and yeah led you to question the things you know led you to having more questions than than probably you wanted to I I do think sometimes though philosophy can deliver answers, and again, it's perhaps that type of philosophy that aligns itself closer to science. It, 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 you, you noted earlier, at some places philosophy is taught in, in in joint schools. I think it's still the case that that Oxford only teaches it as a joint school at uh, right. undergraduate. Mm-hmm. Certainly, it, it was when I, I was there, and I did physics and philosophy, and. Um, Well, there's many uh, philosophers of physics who say, well, I I would rather be in the physics faculty, but they just won't let me in. So, you know, people like my tutor was David Wallace, who first did a physics degree. There's uh, David Albert, who also first did a physics degree and is now, um, there's a great story about David Albert basically being so pissed off (laughs) with his... (laughs) school that he never submitted his corrected thesis. So technically he's not Dr. David Albert, but uh, <laughs> don't think it. But they, no, they just wouldn't, physicists were fed up with people questioning the foundations of physics. They said, okay, no, we, we're, we're, not gonna, we're not gonna think about the origin of quantum mechanics or the meaning of you know why time flows in one direction or, or not. But really to me, it seems like it should be within physics but it, as an outsider it seems to me too doesn't it it, it raises yeah. all sorts of i mean quantum mechanics just raises all sorts of just fascinating philosophical questions it seems to me I mean, can there be a quantum view of the world without the observer who is observing without the physicist well no it, it's kind of agent is it you know is this actually you know cold hard reality or is this somehow observer dependent yeah and if it's observer dependent, which I take it is a view, then um, you know, then it's very close to a kind of Kantian picture. You know, there yeah. is. It's not that w- the world is ordered in so far as we make sense of it. In so far as there's an I think that can organize uh, the manifold of intuition, as he says. So yeah, so I think the, I think f- I think philosophy can to. I mean, when I say deflationary and negative, I think it, that that sense in which it can return you to that that's a huge advance because we, you know, we 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 ride, you know, on a on a we ride day after day on a tide of bullshit of of, of thoughtless bullshit, and philosophy can can clarify that, can reorganize reorganize phenomena, and can get you to actually focus on what's important. That that's sort of an answer, you know, it's, um, yeah. and I think it's, um, yeah, philosophers, science envy. Yeah. I've seen that over the years. Um, it seems to me that physicists are the difference between, yeah, difference between, difference between science and philosophy of science is, 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 is peculiar, isn't it? There's a scientists can be quite sniffy about philosophers of science. Yeah. Which, and I, I mean, for me, that's a prime candidate for something that will just be considered physics in future. Uh, and uh-huh. at some point that there'll be a rapprochement or, you know, and and we won't have that distinction. I mean, particularly because so many people who have a dual training in, in, in physics and philosophy are, are working and, and, you know, they're, they're seriously good at physics. Mm-hmm. And for that reason, they, they get taken seriously. I mean, Sean Carroll is another one to mention who I think is now, you know, he's, he's a, you know, really, really great theoretical physicist who's now got a, I think a joint position in philosophy and uh, physics, I think at Johns Hopkins. But yeah, I, yeah, it, th- there's a tension here for me. And in, in, if we, if we return to the, the other problems, which just can't be solved uh, and yet are still worth looking at. One, 
Actually, let me return to this thought, as I think it maybe illustrates this in a different way. Mm -hmm. In your very short introduction to continental philosophy, you mentioned that you gave a you yeah. gave a talk once. Okay. Yes, I, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. That's, yeah. You gave a talk, and at the end of it, someone came up to you at dinner and said, um, "But why can't I talk to Descartes?" So your talk was about context. Yes. He said, "Why can't I talk to Descartes?" Yes. As if I was talking to you right now. Right. And um, I'll tell you who that was. <laughs> oh yes, go on. As my good friend Tim Crane, he used to okay. teach UCL and then at Cambridge, and now is in uh, the Central European University, which have now moved from Budapest to Vienna, right, or Prague? I think where they've gone. Yeah, Tim. Yeah, he was teasingly said that after a talk I gave at UCL. And I kind of. Uh... On the one hand, I think, well, yes, if these are kind of impossible topics, then and there's kind of no truth to them that can be had. Well, of course, if there's no objective truth, we we kind of need to take into account the circumstances. But on the other hand, I I feel actually no, like some of the things that Descartes says mm -hmm. are just so self-evident that there is a timelessness to them. There is a truth to them. And there seems to have been some progress made. Uh, you know, obviously, there's interesting facts about why Descartes, you know, how he came up with the cogito, you know, I think therefore I am. And we can conjecture that he was influenced by Augustinian Christianity and, and how the reflection of self-reflection can reveal one's relationship with God. We can also speculate about how his kind of dualism was was also influenced by Christianity and um, the you know the fact that we needed to have an immortal soul, but we had clearly pretty mortal bodies. Mm -hmm. And yet, none of that context seems to invalidate. I think, therefore, I am, or sort of yeah. make it convince me more or less of the uh, dualism arguments. Interesting, but so uh, do you still, is it essential or is it color that, that we need to understand that? Yeah, that's a good question. Hmm. Uh, I think it, I mean, when I said that, and that was, um, that was a talk I gave very early on in my career. At, you know, I was in, um, it was Ted Honderick's room, which had been, I don't know, Ayer's room at University College London. It was, it was an intimidating yeah. atmosphere. And I was, uh, yeah. And that, and Tim, who I'd, I'd known Tim for already as a, as a graduate student at Cambridge. And I think, you know, at that point I was much more, defensive about well if you're going to read a philosopher you've got to read them in the original language mm -hmm. to understand the the genre constraints if you're reading descartes the meditations or what are meditations well meditations are a spiritual form of writing that mm -hmm. directly related to uh ignatius loyola you know descartes was educated by jesuits there's this whole kind of jesuitical approach that he's taking it's written in latin and similarly with the discourse on the method this is you know he's writing in french uh, french becomes a literary language really through people like montaigne montaigne's essays and so all of the the literary features in fact that descartes wrote a ballet he was obsessed with marionettes he was he was a complex human being he wasn't an author of treatises with propositions so some a, a book like the uh, the principles of philosophy that descartes writes a late book is, is really interesting because it's written as a series of flat axioms so, mm. so descartes thinking is thinking which gets going as a literary uh within a literary genre and as a literary device like someone like like someone like Pessoa. and it's it was written in the 17th century and you can't just, you know, extract things from their historical context and imagine that these things are speaking to us in, in the same way. 
So there is, I think I want to say contradictory things. There is, yeah, concepts have to be translatable to be understandable, I think. But we have to recognize the fact that certain things are translated and there is, there's, there, there is a historicity to philosophy and we need a context for understanding. So if we just, you know, if we extract Descartes from his, his historical context, we, we lose sight of the actual debates that he was trying to engage in and the sophistication the, the sheer, you know, literary, conceptual self-consciousness of what someone like Descartes was up to. And it becomes a series of kind of flat axioms that one can agree with or disagree with. So it's, to that extent, you know, the difference between analytic and content of philosophy is, to some extent, a question of style, right? And uh, an attentiveness to to style and, and issues like historicity, the contingency of the historical formation of concepts and there's a tendency in analytic philosophy to reduce everything to argument right this is uh-huh. what plato's saying this and is this true or false yeah and, well you know it's really not clear what plato is saying he doesn't say anything in his own voice he certainly didn't, didn't believe in platonism he appears twice he's not even there when the um, you know when uh, Socrates' death scene in, in the Phaedo, so so the level of so to that extent, philosophy is a, a heteronymic enterprise, not unlike Pessoa for me. It's and Plato's dialogues are a myriad of different perspectives on on uh, on questions where Socrates appears sometimes it doesn't appear appears as younger older and then and plato will do things which are completely willfully contradictory so the end of republic which is an extraordinary series of arguments which show the connection between democracy uh, to be between theater democracy and tyranny populism in our terms that we end up with this bizarre story about the immortality of the soul the myth of Ur, which people kind of just don't read they forget about mm. and then there's another dialogue which was the most longest most continuously read dialogue of plato's throughout the last few thousand years the timaeus which survived in a manuscript copy which is set the day after the republic it was written probably 15 20 years later it's not clear but he sets it the day after Republic and and Timaeus I think Critias says so what'd you talk about yesterday I heard you had a good conversation down at the Piraeus you know and also the setting that's very important it's not in the city it's down at the port in a merchant's house all these things are not incidental and then Socrates himself gives a summary of the Republic which is terrible and uh, and then and then we go into this bizarre kind of cosmology of, of Timaeus, the closest we get to a kind of general physical theory. And Socrates having, in, in, we, we see him elsewhere, you know, cross-examining everybody at every moment. He just says, oh, yeah, Timaeus, that's great. Let's hear some more. Oh, that's terrific. Let's hear some <laughs> more weird stuff. So, so who Plato is, I think, is really unclear. And, and how we're meant to respond to that. I think we we can't reduce that to a set of arguments. I mean, remember AJ Eyre had this series called Arguments of the Philosophers. Yeah, philosophers are, have arguments, but there's a lot more they have as well. And so I, the approach that I take wants to fill out that picture. Hmm. And that might lead to a, a quite different approach. I mean, I, you know, I had my... You know my my, my suspicions of, of philosophy. You know the idea that there is a that there is there is a final vocabulary, uh, mm. as Rorty would say, a final vocabulary by which we can capture reality in a series of concepts is a philosophical dream that arguably has not survived the last few centuries, and so that would be where the deflation goes. Mm. I'm increasingly, I mean, as as I was very critical of Rorty in the when I was a lot younger and as I've 
as I've got older um, and also I've got to know people that really knew Rorty, I'm, I'm more and more sympathetic to him. I really think he was onto something. And also, Rorty wrote, I mean, just beautiful prose, powerful, beautiful prose, and um, clear and jargon free and engaging. And so he's mm. a kind of paradigm as to how a philosopher should write. And of course, you know, he's. He sees himself in the tradition of um, someone who I've increasingly, I, someone that I, I was not educated in, didn't know much about, but now I think is so important, who is uh, William James, who I think is just kind of, you know, if there were a philosopher that I'd like to have a few drinks with, it would be William James, because that would be, that would be fun. And there'd probably be nitrous oxide involved. <laughs> <laughs> I, lo I love Rorty's, I mean, it's a little bit disparaging and probably tongue in cheek where he describes his line that you quote that, you know, continental philosophy is a kind of procession of proper names and yes. uh, analytic philosophy is concerned with problems, so problems versus proper names. And it, that does link back to this idea that um, the person is important within, yep. within that tradition, whereas the problem is 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 primary uh, mm -hmm. and and the one requires you know necessarily is is it is a person in time to mm -hmm. use uh, a bit of high diggers thought and 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 in a context but yeah i i, I still i see i kind of i think maybe they are angling at, at different things I'm thinking of the line of Wittgenstein of, you know, kicking away the ladder. I think that was originally Schopenhauer's actually. And that, you know, all this context is, is all well and good, but if you can extract that idea from uh, Descartes, you've done it. And, and actually in some ways you want to get rid of the ladder because it's just kind of so much, um, I don't know, it, it will encumber you, I suppose. On the other hand, I think you know one misses things well, without the his on that right. Wittgenstein gives up on uh, you know he was you know he was as he say he was you know, he was bewitched by a certain picture of language and logic. And, uh, yeah, well, he said that about. I, I, I guess his point was about language and um, and the investigations is really about context, right? Don't look at the for me. Look for the use, you know, all of that stuff. But Schopenhauer's line on kicking away the ladder, which is perhaps. A, better formulation of it is that when you're learning, if you're interested in getting to understanding, you can look at the particulars, um, but at some point you can kick away that ladder and, and you've arrived at your at your knowledge. Whereas obviously the phenomenologists are, are saying, well, no, you, you you really need to hang on to those details, which include the, the, the context. And I, I mean, I see the, the merits of both. There is a neatness, which you find in, you know, Obviously, the analytic, analytic tradition again very inspired by uh, science here. Where you know the life of Einstein is great; it's really entertaining. Lots of uh, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful incidents going on there, but it doesn't doesn't change anything about the validity of his, his theories. And you can you can you know study physics without caring one jot about how Einstein. Yes. Also remember that Heidegger says Heidegger when he begins his lecture course on Aristotle, in oh yeah, two says that Aristotle was born, he worked, he died. That's yeah. all we need to know. Let's get into. Let's you just at, need to know the dates. <laughs> look yeah. at the physics and the metaphysics and get into the arguments. So there is that. Yeah, uh, there is that. That's you know the idea of you know, phenomenology. In herself sees itself as a rigorous science, transcendental first principles. So there's, there's that too. I think it's. Yeah, I think the the problems proper names distinction I think has been over overblown in the sense in which I think I, I react reacted to the let's say the emphasis on problems um, in the and arguments which loses context and history and all of that. But so let me put this another way. So my work has kind of failed on multiple fronts but i mean the continental philosophers as far as i'm aware think of me as a kind of renegade because i'm too close to 
analytic philosophy and have done too much kind of you know back in the 90s bridge building and i you know irreverence and i i you know i think that there's a kind of there is a name worship in continental philosophy and people just you know doing a lot of fluff and uh not really saying much and uh and arguments from authority you know lacan says something or you know bad you says Blah 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 blah. And I think that's 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 not thinking. So that side of the continental tradition, I think, leads to yes. This is the way I look at it. And this goes back to the OUP book. I think continental philosophy at its worst becomes obscurantism. Yeah. It's the rejection of a scientific view of the world in the name of some higher, slightly mysterious cause, being, or or power, or will to power, or whatever it might be, or the drives in psychoanalytic terms and and s- analytic philosophy at its worst can lead to scientism the reduction of philosophy to basically the methodology of the natural sciences and a rather positivistic and narrow understanding is this isn't even this isn't even what scientists do it seems to me it's what philosophers imagine that scientists do so those two problems of obscurantism and scientism need to be identified and pushed away as far as possible and then we need to occupy more of a kind of central space middle ground which um i think thinkers like wittgenstein later wittgenstein are kind of that's the ground that they're in and that's that's where we can um that's where we can do our work but you're never going to keep out in scientism you know you know the the ai you know, scaremongering is, you know, one version of that right now, right? And in a year's time, it will be something else. And the obscurantism, it's never going to go away. People are going to believe all sorts of weird shit because they're horribly misinformed and deluded by different things. So to that extent, philosophy, you know, has a really tough and continuous job of trying to push those two things aside and to get people to focus on here and now and what's in front of them and what the context of emergence for that thing in front of them was. And um, that's, uh, that's what I'd like to do. And that, and insofar as that's happened in, I think that, yeah, I think it's, I think that could be done, you know, and I'll just keep on keeping on. (laughs) Well, I think it's, it's important that there are, rebels right <laughs> and uh, yeah yeah there are yeah this is important um i just want to ask I, I, I'm more of, I see more of it you know i see you know I, I on my most narcissistic and deluded days i like to see what i do as you know informed by stand-up comedians like Stuart lee well, his relationship to comedy is very much my relationship to philosophy. You use the forms and you you move within them, and then you try and you try and pull things away. You try and point things out, and and to deliberately kind of inhabit a series of personae and, and fictions in order to. And what you're trying to do with that, or all, all we're trying to do, is to give people permission to think on their own, right? Uh, and that's that's what we're try to do with teaching is to get them to think on their own and do their own stuff and um and 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 also i think the other the other side of where we are now is is really taking i mean philosophy has to be a continuous takedown of ideology in whatever form it takes but you know one version of that right now say where i teach uh at the new school is you know, the ideology of social justice, you know, that the, the idea that we know what society is and we know what justice is. And if philosophy has shown one thing is that we don't have answers to those questions, right? We can't be, we can't be committed to something we haven't the vaguest idea about, you know, our, our task is to, I mean, philosophy asks the question in the Republic, what is justice? Doesn't really come up with a good answer. It's related to virtue at some level. It's, perhaps orientated towards the good and we can tell stories about that but we don't know that cognitively we can't we can't base a moral view of the world on that that is 
that's a form of ideology which needs to be exposed. So I think that philosophy has an obligation to um, expose ideology. And that's true here. It was true of, I don't know, it was true of, you know, philosophers in the, you know, Eastern Europe, you know, the great Hungarian traditions of Lukács and Agnes Heller, my former colleague, or what people like Jan Patochka were up to in the former Czechoslovakia. You know, that's what you, you know, you, you point out the emperor's new clothes and that, that is, yeah, that, that's progress. That's, that, that's something. Yeah. And, and, um, yeah. I mean, that's, it, I actually, it's all the way back to Socrates, right? He was the, the gadfly. He was, um, yeah. Past- and they killed him. Yeah. <laughs> killed him. He kind of was asking for it, but it was, but they, they kill it. It's important to remember that, that this is, this is a high stakes game. This isn't, you know, we're not, we're not civil servants of humanity, as, as Husserl said. We are, yeah, we, we're at best we're gadflies and you're going to get swatted, which is, you know, that's what, that's, you know, philosophers do still get imprisoned and killed. And, and in many countries, it's still illegal or has become illegal as a, as a, as a form of activity. So I think we, you know, we take these things for granted. I think what's, what's changed in the last generation has been, I think thanks to things like podcasts now, I think audio is, I think the internet has been really good for philosophy. It's been really bad for literature, but it's been really good for philosophy. It's made things accessible, compressible, usable. And I think that audio is another uh, really promising area because I think, I mean, my basic view is that people's, our eyes are tired, but our ears are still slightly open. Uh, our eyes are exhausted because we're constantly looking at screens and things all the time, but there's, there's something our ears can, can take things in and philosophy can drip its poison through, through the ear. So I, I experimented in 2020 with this podcast called Applied Digger, yeah. which was, uh, which was great fun to do, you know, and, um, and to try and make this difficult book accessible as a series of, series of audio episodes and that was so i do think that this is a this is kind of what the platform where philosophy will happen i don't think it's going to happen on film or on tv it doesn't seem to work visually very well uh, in my experience it's but audio i think offers you know very interesting possibilities it's a great podcast at the moment i'm listening to by with Taylor Carman and Eric Kaplan called Terrifying Questions, which is really good, uh, where they just take – Eric Kaplan is a – they both did PhDs with Hubert Dreyfus. But he went into comedy writing, where it was a writer for the Big Bang Theory. I've worked with him a little bit on um, Stuff of the Stone back in the day, but – and they take a difficult question. That's – and you feel that – I think that's where – that's where things have migrated for the present moment. I think it does raise questions about what we're doing in the classroom with lectures and with uh, and and how we can get students to read. I think that's these are huge difficulties. Yeah. How I mean, it was difficult enough when so when you were a student and when I was a student to get to to to, to push the, to push things out in order to work through Descartes' meditations. But yeah. you know, if you that plus a smartphone is just impossible. You know, yeah. and so the, but I think the ears, I think audio is, it's a possibility, which is, I think is, is, is full of, it, it encourages me. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I think that is a beautiful place to, to, to end it. I mean, I, I think we're, I mean, not to be too um, self aggrandizing here, but I think this is the new Agora, right? <laughs> we're new talking, Agora. we're talking and it forces, it forces one to use plain language and and mm-hmm. there's no hiding i think uh in a conversation like this so yeah thank you so much for your time simon this thank you very much james fun. it was a great pleasure where are you where are you physically located i'm in i'm in edinburgh yeah oh so, right Stuart Lee was here just a couple of weeks ago i didn't catch him this year i saw him last year for the for the festival but yeah let me know if you're ever around we read the uh i reread the how I escaped myself. Fate. I think it's the best.